Good morning. Happy Father's Day. You fathers and grandfathers and father figures, we appreciate you very much. And we're glad you're here to worship with us. Could you stand and we'll open. <coughs>
There's a line in here that just gets me every time. He made us, he has made us a kingdom and priests to God to reign with the Son. I don't think I walk around my life fully knowing that I am, I've been made a, a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. And the more we can realize the Holy Spirit is with us everywhere we go, we are the temple. And wherever we go, we can influence people. And just keeping in mind that he is there with us wherever we go. 
Amen. Amen.
Jesus. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to. Amen. So good to worship the Lord this morning. As we uh, get ready for this morning's message, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is so good to be in your presence this morning, and we just love worshiping you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those great fathers out there that have poured into us. And Father, if we're, um, maybe today we miss our father, maybe he, you know, they've gone on to be with you, Lord, and we just thank you that they're with you. But Father, we also pray we miss them, but fill us with the encouragement that we can look to our Heavenly Father. You are good, and you are perfect in every way. Father, i got to admit, a lot of us dads, we, we let our families down at times, and we ask for your forgiveness and your protection. But, Lord, we have a good heavenly Father that we can all look to who is perfect and right. So we look to you today for strength and for wisdom, for care, for your love, for your guidance. Father, we also, I also pray your protection over those in this community that are going through a difficult season. I pray that you just come alongside of them, wrap your arms of love around them. 
Father, I also lift up to those, uh, we see those farmers out in those fields right now. And so, Father, we pray for your protection over them. I pray for safety over them. I pray for bountiful crops, God, as they uh, see that crop come in, they really take care of their families and bless them, Father. Those farmers, we're thankful for them. So, Father, we just, as a church body, we lift up all the needs of the church. And so, Father, we just thank you for your love, your care, your provisions. Your, everything is a gift from you, Father. So we want to give back to you. And we say thank you for a good, being a good, good father. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. If you can be seated. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. We're going to be in uh, 1 Peter, if you have your Bibles. And we're going to be in chapter 3 today, if you have them. Uh, we're going to be at the beginning of chapter 3. We've been in 1 Peter the last number of weeks. And uh, we've made it through two chapters. And we're going to start the third chapter today. And I just want to remind you as we're kind of diving through God's Word. I want to tell you, a, a number of months ago, we decided we're going to preach on uh, 1 Peter, okay? And so when that happens, we preach through the book. And, and a lot of times you come along things and you're like, ah, boy, I told you last week, I wouldn't mind skipping this section, right? And just seeing if they ever noticed, you know? But we, gotta, that, we let God's word set the agenda, okay? So it may, you, know, but you may be going through something hard or difficult and, boy, Pastor George is kind of hard today, you know? We come along difficult texts and we just go through them. We walk through them because that's God's word. It's God's word. And so we just walk through it and allow God to speak to us and minister to us through it. And so I pray that you'll be able to apply God's word to it as we come to a text today, as we deal with it and look at husbands and wives and submitting and what that looks like. I mean, if you're in chapter 3, verse 1, if you look at that right off the bat, it says this. It says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, okay? Uh, happy Father's Day, all right? This is, oh boy, you know. <laughs> uh, but the thing I want us to focus on there at the, in the, at the beginning, it says, likewise, okay? That's the, the same word that we would use for in the same way, okay? So this is referring to these relationships. These relationships we talked about last week and this week are examples, okay, that as Christians, okay, as, as exiles, as people where we recognize this is not our home, right, how we should live because there's going to be times where an unjust, unfair relationship has happened, unjust treatment has taken place, and so how do we, live, how do we deal with those in these different examples? That's what he's kind of doing. And so he used two examples last week were unjust government authorities and unjust just rulers over us. And so that's when we face those in all relationships, in all relationships, he's saying, look to Christ as the example. Okay, and we've, I got to tell you, if you want to memorize God's word, you should memorize God's word. It comes out and it's faithful and it's fruitful in your life at the right time when you need it. It'll be the thing that keeps you strong. So if you want to memorize God's word, I want to tell you, memorize chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. Incredible passage, and we've talked about it just briefly the last couple weeks. I'm going to read it again because it's really important. Because when we face a season of unjust season, how do we handle it? How do we live with it as a Christian? And he's going to say, follow the example of Christ. Verse 21 in chapter 2 says, For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. In uh, verse 23, when he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And he himself bore our sins on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for his righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. That comes from Isaiah 53. And you know there's a lot of things from that that we see in the example of Christ. So the first thing is when you face unjust relationship or a difficulty or a boss or a government leader, we are incredibly, we need to be patient. Christ was patient, wasn't he? You know, he understood that even in that suffering, that suffering was a part of God's ultimate plan for salvation in Jesus Christ. And by his wounds, we, are, we have been healed. We have been saved. The world has come to know Jesus through his death on the cross. We've been made into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And so a lot of us as Christians, we think, you know what? I'm a Christian. Things should be good. It should be easy sailing from here. And friend, it's not always true. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be difficulty in those hardships. Verse 22 and 24 point to be patient. Okay? Be patient in that. The other thing it says that when an injustice occurs, 
in verse uh, 23, he says, he trusted it over to the one who judges justly. A lot of us really want to see the justice and the vengeance and, and kind of make it fair, Lord. Let us see it with our own eyes, and we don't sometimes get to see it, you know? Christ didn't get to see it. He, he said, I'm going to trust that over to the one who judges justly. And then even while you're being persecuted, even while you're going through that hardship, Christ set an example by kept doing good. He just, in verse 23, it kind of talked about that. Even while being slandered, even by being ridiculed and made fun of, he kept extending grace and love and forgiveness on the cross, saying, yes, today you will be with me in paradise. And so we need to keep on doing the right thing. Keep our head in the game. We keep serving the Lord Jesus. So use that as the example in all of these areas, all of these relationships. That's the big point, okay? So now he's going to apply that that whole example, that whole idea to marriage, okay? So that's where we're going to dive in today. So chapter 3, verse 1, I'm going to read 1 through 7 now. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some of you do not obey the word, even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word, but by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy woman who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, I know this is Father's Day, husbands. Don't ask your wives to call you Lord today, okay? It will not go over well. Don't do that, okay? So just get, you know, you're not sure about that one. Okay, so, and then as in verse 6, it finishes up, and you are her children, and if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. So real quickly, ladies, I want you to know that's going to be the big question for you today, okay? How do you submit to your husbands in a Christ-like way? How do you submit to your husband in a Christ-like way? That's the one we're going to wrestle with. And I'm going to tell you, in Peter's mind, probably the, the greatest example was a husband that didn't know the Lord. So a wife that was a believer in Jesus Christ and the husband who didn't really, was unsaved, didn't know the Lord because that was the most common. Okay, so maybe you, you know an example like that. But also, maybe you're both believers, okay? And I'm going to tell you, friends, in every marriage, there's struggles, there's battles, there's times where your spouse lets you down, right? And so even in those moments, how do you respond with a Christ-like attitude? So that's what we're going to wrestle with today. Verse 7, it goes on. It says, likewise, in the same way, husbands, there's a point for you as well. There's an application for you too. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. That's a Word we don't like to really understand or hear today in this, this world, modern world, but uh, as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So men, there's a question for you today. What does it look like for you to honor your wife? as a Christian, as a Christ-like way? How do we honor our wives in a Christ-like way? So we're going to wrestle with that. Some of you are saying, you know what? When I'm on the golf course, I do the best to answer the phone, you know, and that's kindness, respect. Husbands, we got to do a little bit better. We got to dig in and care for and learn what it looks like to love our spouse. So today, if you want to take notes, I'm going to give you three ways to honor your spouse. That's what I'm going to give you, three ways to honor your spouse that we see in this passage. And the first way is, is Peter's going to talk about there's a power. There's a power husbands and wives we both have, okay? And so I'm going to ask, we're going to ask that you use the power that you have been given to bless and serve and encourage your spouse and not to manipulate and control them, Okay? So that's point number one. Use the power to bless, serve, encourage them. And because uh, here Peter's going to point out, you guys have different powers. Men, okay, we're going to talk about that. Men have what would a lot of people would say, a, a physical power, okay? Typically, men are bigger and stronger, and so therefore they, that might have been the primary means which what Peter was addressing when he said in verse 7, he calls her the weaker vessel, okay? So that's primarily what I think Peter was thinking in his mind. It also could have been thinking about Roman law during this time, okay? Because Roman law during this time was much better for the men than the women, okay? 
Men almost were expected to have affairs. They could have affairs, okay? And they could just go on, no big deal, and come back to their wife. Wives, that was not allowed in any way, any form, okay? Also, men could divorce their wives for almost any reason possible. I mean, like you didn't, you know, she kept burning the potatoes, and you're like, man, I just need to find, you know, so, you know they could divorce for any reason, basically. Women could not divorce really at all. It was very hard for them. And if they did, I want you to know, a divorce completely favored the men. It was like they got all the money, they got the kids, they got everything. And, and the women had to work very hard jobs in order to make ends meet. And so that could have been what he was meeting there as also a weaker vessel. Also, in, in the New Testament, God's Word gives us a, a authority, a leadership position to men in the families, and he could have been referring to that. And that's a, a good thing if the men use it in a Christ-like way, but if not, it can be dangerous and hurtful. And then also, some commentators believe that maybe the Peter is referring to that how God built them, that women are a little bit, he could have said weaker in the sense that they're more maybe emotional, uh, maybe, you know, maybe have more compassion, more of a mothering instinct, which doesn't mean that's inferior, okay? That's a good thing. Uh, it's kind of like maybe Peter was saying, which one's stronger, uh, a crowbar or a thermometer? You know, it's like a crowbar, you cannot bend that thing. It's tough. But a thermometer, you could probably break it, but the thermometer probably is more useful. You could probably you do a lot more things with the thermometer and, and be a lot more helpful in a lot of ways. And so that could have been the way Peter was kind of talking about. But I want to be clear, all of those possibilities of what he's talking about there does not mean that the woman is inferior in any way, okay? That does not mean, because he says there, Peter says that she is heirs with you in the grace of life. So she is an heir with you, right alongside of you in Christ, okay? So she is a full equal, okay? And so whatever power you have in the relationship should be used to honor her, to build her up, to encourage her, and to serve her. You know, that's what he's talking about here. He says, live in an understanding way. Live in a way where you actually grasp how she's built, how she's wired. So if she is a little bit more, uh, you know, emotional and caring, you say, boy, that's a strength that I don't have. So let's build that up, encourage that, use that as a, a blessing in your marriage. That's our role. So use whatever position, whatever power you have, men, to serve her. Because that's what Christ did with his strength and with his power. He came and he set an example of how to serve. And so I want you to know, however, if a man uses his physical strength to dominate or, or uses his Christian um, way of saying, hey, you, submission, Christian view of submission to get her to dominate her in some way, I'm telling you, friend, that's not a good use of this passage. That's incorrect. That's not how Christ used his passage. Christ came and he served. He wrapped himself up with garments and he put a towel around him. He went and washed his disciples' feet He went with the water basin. That's what Christ did. So we wake up and we say, hey, if I'm going to lead in a Christ-like way, I'm going to serve my wife. That's what it looks like. And so because of that, on most days, you know what that means? I'm going to allow her preferences to win the day. That's what it looks like. So I ask myself, how can I lift her up? How can I serve my wife? And that should be a question for, uh, for, the, for the woman as well. You know, how can I serve my husband in the same way? Because a man's marriage, uh, leadership in the marriage, is really not a license to do whatever he wants. It's, to, it's kind of an empowerment to do what he should do in Christ. When we're submitting ourselves to Christ's authority, then we're going to serve, we're going to submit, we're going to lift up our wives. And so that's what it looks like. Okay, so uh, now for the women, we're going to dive into this. What does it look like, you know, when we kind of use your power? What power does he talk about here? Well, the first thing Peter says is about their beauty and their sensuality. And Peter indicates that a lot of women kind of build their identity on this idea of how beautiful I can make myself, how beautiful I can present myself, because that might get me some power. I might be able to use that to my advantage, right? Right? And so he says that in verse 3, he says, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, and the clothing you wear. So 
He's not saying you can't, you can't ever braid your hair. You have to always live with a bun. You know, that's not what he's saying here. He's saying here, don't let your external, you know, also dominate who you are. Don't let that just be the substance of your life and your beauty. Okay, friend? You know, and I know that our culture is t- telling us this. It's, boy, you know, be you know, better looking on the outside, get the right picture, all those different things. That's what our culture is saying. But I want you to know, as, as women, your power should be in your character, and the character of Christ, you know, and that's the thing that we want to display because you are valuable to God. And the most valuable thing that you have to God is your Christ-like character. So he's saying, let that shine. In verse 4, he says, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. He talks about a a gentle and a quiet spirit. So I can't be outgoing, I can't be, you know, loud. No, that's not what he's saying here. A gentle, quiet spirit is a spirit that's at peace with God, that you trust, you fully trust God. You have submitted your life to him and you're under his authority and his leadership and that's what we do. And so how do we do this? You know, when we do this as a Christ-like example to our husbands, we, we serve and, we, you know, so I want you to know, uh, for those of you, you know, that think uh, maybe I should just, you know, make this picture a little bit better. I should dress a little bit, get those cool shoes. That can all be good, but don't let that be your main priority. Don't let that be your main, let your character in Christ be seen. I know those uh, ladies out there that are single. You know, a lot of us do this. I do this at times. You know, we take about 20 photos and, and then we post the one where it has the right angle, you know, and the right lighting. And you're like, that one I can't post. I was looking the long, wrong way. And we do that. But friend, post what your character is in Christ. Let them see that, how much you love, you know, children and let, let them see how much you love the Lord. And when they see that, you're going to be drawing a man that's going to love Jesus Christ and wants to care for you uh, the biblical way and submit and care for and love you like Christ. And that's what we need to show and sign, you know, sign up for. And so I just want to encourage you that you would, you know, shine with the love of Christ. Let the character be known. That's what he's saying here. Let the inward, inward beauty of the character of Christ be known. And for those of you that are married, another way to apply this, another application of this, is he's saying, hey, using your sexual appeal to get, your, get you what you want is not the best way. It's not the best way to use your power. That's not what Christ did. He's not saying, you know, when you, know, you want something, you go up to him and say, hey, honey, you know, and you just say, you know, when things are, you know, not going well and you had a fight that night, you say, you're not getting any kisses tonight. You're not supposed to hold back and give back, you know, your beauty. You're supposed to serve your husband and serve your wife as one in Christ. And so don't hold back. Don't use that as a manner. Christ didn't, that's not how he used his power, his authority. He came to serve and model for us what it looks like. And so I just want to call out, those are some of the ways that we're called to use our power. We're called to use that power that God's gifted us with to build up our spouses, to encourage them, not to tear them down, not to try to control them. That's how God intended it. So that's point number one. Point number two is I want to give you this. In all things, we continue to do good, we obey God, and then we trust Him. That's what he's modeling here. That's what we do in the face of just injustice. When, when you've been wronged, he says, follow the example of Christ. And he committed himself to his heavenly father, who a judge who judges justly. And then he kept doing good, and he kept trying to, you know, praise, uh, trust God with the results. That's what he did. And he uses an example here in this passage of Sarah. So go back to verse 5. It says this, For this is how the holy woman who hoped and God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So he uses this example of Sarah, and it's a really helpful example. Because I got to tell you, you know, we have a song. We all, a lot of us think of Father Abraham, right? Pretty great guy. Father Abraham had many sons, you know, and that's a pretty happy song. We sing that a lot. But I got to tell you, Abraham blew it a lot too. 
Okay, he didn't, you know, he made some mistakes and he led his family where they shouldn't go at times and he made some bad decisions. But here's how Sarah stayed and submitted to his leadership. That's what she did. That's, she, said, she didn't say, oh no, this guy, you know, making bad decisions. I'm out of here. We need to put someone else in charge. No, she committed herself to God. And she, she says, in doing so, she didn't fear what was frightening. Okay, so therefore she submitted herself. To the Lord, and she just continued to obey the Lord and walk with Him. And so, so, at times, maybe your husband or your spouse makes a bad decision, okay? And they make a. So, what do we do in the marriage? Your attitude can be still to honor them, lift them up, submit to the Lord, trust the Lord, keep following the Lord. And so that's what we do. But I also want you to know that no. Peter's point here is that you don't. Someone else's sin doesn't justify you in sinning. So when they're making a bonehead decision or a bad decision, you still honor the Lord. That's what he's saying here. Continue to honor the Lord. Don't, you know, trust the Lord. Obey the Lord and and respectfully, kindly walk in submission to them, but also obey the Lord. Don't give up. Don't let their sin dictate that you sin and walk uh, in sin as well. So that's what he's calling us to do. In Psalm 125, that's the example of Christ, says, The Lord is good to those who walk uprightly. He is their shield and their support. So you continue to walk in the Lord. If they're straying, they're walking away, they're not doing the right thing, you continue to trust in God and trust Him and and walk in His ways. And that's what he's talking about here. In the same way, when, you know, when husbands or spouses take things into their own hands and mess things up, then what happens is they are missing out on the blessing of God. And that's what it says. And basically in verse 7, it says, Likewise, husbands, show honor to the woman so that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words, you know what? Don't use your power to coerce them and try to make them do it your way. You may be able to, but friend, in having them do it your way by force, I'm telling you, you're causing them to miss out on the blessings of God, and that is far worse. So friend, honor them, lift them up, continue to walk in the Lord, continue to be strengthened by the Lord, and you will not be missing out on God's blessing. That's what he's saying here. And that's why we got to continue to walk in the Lord. So you continue to do good, care for them, love them, and then you obey God and you trust God as you walk through that season. The third point I want to give you this morning, and we'll kind of finish with this, is that I want you to know, a lot of us want to know, how can I change my spouse? How can I change them? And a lot of us want to change them. They've hurt us and I want to get them back. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's point number three, is that grace is the more powerful change agent than retaliation, than just trying to get them back and get justice in your own eyes. And a lot of people will agree with that. They're like, yeah, that's, that's true. I agree with that. But we don't really live it out. We kind of want to get them back, you know. But I got to tell you, I've seen it over and over and over again. When you, someone experiences grace, it changes their heart. And then it causes them to want to change as well. Some of you may have seen the musical Les Mis. There's a powerful scene at the beginning where he is changed right at the beginning. Victor Hugo's out there and he's changed not by an act of retaliation and getting even. He's changed by an act of grace. And that's what changes his heart and causes him to live differently. And I got to tell you, there's so many different examples. Maybe you've, you know, seen a waitress or a a boss that's treated you unfairly and they've said things about you that were hurtful and rude and you know you'd love to just get them back. But instead, when they walk through a difficult season and they're hurting, you go to them and you care for them and you minister to them even though they've betrayed you, even though they've hurt you, even though they've shown you injustice. What happens? That grace allows them to see the grace of God. And allows the, God's grace to enter and work in their life and transform them. They say, why are you doing this? You know what I've said against you. You know how I've treated you. And you're still showing me grace? Grace is the most powerful change agent. And that, I really believe, is what Peter's referring to when he talks about you know, how to you know, change someone. He says, they may be one without a word, but by the conduct of their wives. That's what he's talking about here. 
how you show grace, how you show kindness and mercy. You, you want to change their heart? It's not by manipulating them, controlling them, taking the power you have and lording it over them. It's by caring for them, surrendering and serving them in Jesus Christ. And that's what will win them. That's what Peter's talking about here. So as we close today, you have a power. How are you using that power in your relationship? Are you using it in a Christ-like way? Are you using it to care for and, and support your spouse? Are you using it to kind of control and dictate who they are? And then, you know, in the relationship also, are you continuing to care for them, continuing to do good? And are you trusting the Lord? Don't give in to their sin. Don't, you know, let that become part of your life and your way. You're not called to that. You're still called to obey the Lord, but are you going to trust him even through that season? And finally, you know, as you're kind of restoring that relationship or walking through that season, or you want to see that change, are you able to show them grace? Because you know what? When we see the grace that God's given us, I got to tell you, friend, I'm a sinner. Every one of us, we are sinners in God's eyes. And so when we see what he is saying, no, 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 you're not, you have value. No, 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 we can change that. No, no, you, I love you. That's the grace of God reaching out to you, friend. And we need to respond to that when we see the wickedness of our sin. We say, man, God's grace is so good. I can extend this to my friend, my, my, my partner, my spouse. I can extend, extend grace. So are you able to do that with a Christ-like attitude? And I pray that we would see those three attributes as we love our spouses. So I pray that God would use that in your, your, your relationships and your marriages as well. Let's pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning. And Father, we, I just want to tell you we blow it all the time. We blow it in marriages. We blow it in our relationships. And Father, there's been times where there's hurts, maybe through an unjust boss or a, a friend or someone who's betrayed us. And Father, it's hard. With our eyes, with the flesh, we say, boy, get, you know, we'd love to see justice. We'd love to see you and get that back. And let me see that, Lord. But Father, we may not see it with our own eyes. And we want to entrust it over to you who will judge justly, who will make all things right. Father, because we're not living for this home. We're living for heaven, to be with you, Lord, forever. And that's what we get our hearts excited about. So, Father, help us to kindly love our spouses. Help us to kindly submit in leadership and serve them, Lord, as you served us and set the example for us. Let, us, let Christ be the example in how we love one another and how we love those who have hurt us unjustly. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we close in worship. See?
Amen. So good to worship with you this morning. Hope you have a blessed week and try to stay cool as well. Hear the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed week.